Explorations presents Amateur Hour. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Explorations. It's Rob, Damien, and Ian here with you tonight. It's our first show of what we're calling Amateur Hour, a show where we talk about things we don't really know that much about, but we still know more than most of the population. So tonight, uh, we are talking about backcountry paddling. I like the uh, explanation of what Amateur Hour is. It's like, we don't know much about it, but we know more than some people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, backcountry paddling, something we've all done, we all obviously enjoy, because we keep doing it. Why do we do it? And also a question I get asked a lot, like, why are you leaving your house? Why are you going out into the woods? It's dangerous. Cool, I'll go first. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, why do I go? Uh, I think, for me, the, the key takeaway from it that keeps me coming back is the fact that you get to go to a place that's so isolated from everything else. So whether it be portaging or kayaking or whatever... Uh, it's usually off the beaten path from like a standard campsite or something like that. So you never see anyone there and you always just get to find these wonderful little beautiful tranquil places that no one really uh, gets to find. Yeah, absolutely. And people yeah. are all about car camping and like I love car camping too, don't get me wrong, but there's just that certain little bit of extra you get when you kind of exploring somewhere that not everybody wants to go to or has the opportunity to go to i guess yeah uh there's so many different types of camping but at the end of it all like the nicest thing about camping is is escaping everything and it's i don't know i feel like paddling is the ultimate escape of everything same and i would say i would say it's in the same boat as haha <laughs> boat um i would say it's in the same boat as like uh like backcountry camping or super isolated uh, climbing trips or something like that. But like the the key is like it's difficult and, <laughs> it, and it makes it that much more isolated because no one wants to do it. Yeah, I think uh, the, the major thing for me that appeals um, that appeals to me is just the the nature in itself. Uh, just heading out there in the remoteness, away from a lot of people, like you guys are saying about front country camping. Yeah, sure, it's still great. <clears throat> um, so get to have that nature connection, but there's something different about oh, the washroom's right there, as opposed to I gotta dig a latrine now, um, and then just kind of being nomadic or pastoral for that matter uh, for a short period of time, being like the weekend warriors that we are now, but. Um, <laughs> It's it's there, there are beautiful aspects to the back country that the front country you cannot see. And I will say, like outright, like uh, yeah, a lot of my experience lately. Um, I'm from Ontario, but I live in BC right now. So there's not a lot of portaging out here. There's not a lot of canoe camping really. Uh, for the most part, everything is is kayak based. So uh, yeah, you'd be more but, ocean. That's right, paddling. but it's still just as isolating as as anything. It's just a uh, it's just a different kind of animal. You're more like, still, like checking tide schedules and. <laughs> oh my god, it's crazy. Yeah, that would be incredibly different. I think coming from Ontario to experience tidal to um, needing to timing it correctly, um, especially if you want to go somewhere fast. Like yeah, catch the tide as you paddle out. Yeah, super fast. You definitely have to watch those tide charts for sure, because um, they'll they'll just all of a sudden change, and you're like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going from traveling at like whatever it is, like 10, 15 kilometers an hour, to negative five kilometers an hour, uh, where you're like literally trying your hardest not to go backwards, and it's like this is insanity. Like I can't believe that it's so powerful. Canoeing though, like. Canoeing, it has that, I would say that's probably the biggest limitation to kayaking versus canoeing is like, for kayaking, you're always on the water and and you kind of have to choose the adventure because of that. You can't portage a kayak, you know, like you no one's portage portaging, a kayak. No one's portaging a, a, an ocean kayak with two seats mm, in it. Yeah, like, maybe that's, not. 
not happening. Those things sure are. Have. It's just not ideal by any means. Right. What's the weight on an ocean kayak? I want to say like 50, 60 pounds. Oh, you can pour yeah. Taj. Like, I, I'm totally, <laughs> I have that's complete amateur hour. I will say it takes two people to carry it for any that's distance. That's totally fair. That's fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, the nice thing that I, I think is, is a difference. Like I think overall with canoeing, you're probably going to stay a lot more dry than you will with a kayak, right? Oh, yeah. Even on, like, a regular flat body of water, um, I just find I'll get more wet in a kayak. And all of your gear, too, right? Like, so that's, like, a huge part of what kayaking has as a benefit is we have, like, separated compartments that are storing everything. Uh, yeah, for sure. Gross. I'd imagine too, though, for kayaking, you would end up putting a few things in a dry sack on top of the deck on the, on the kayak in front, you know, back maybe. Oh, if it's a big trip, depends no, how you light know. your pack, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're uh, like, it depends on, I guess, how long you're going to be on the water and what you need, right? Um, <laughs> for me, with kayaking, it, the key is like, I'll leave like a backpack out. Uh, underneath some bungees and stuff like that and nothing in that backpack is something i'm concerned about getting wet and what do you put your snacks in like a like you have a smaller dry bag in your pack or no i literally just uh so for me personally i just have a backpack like a like an 18 liter backpack that i leave at oh okay and it's just in the pack it's like a standard uh what's really nice um about that is i'll typically put a hydration pack in it and then you just have quick access to a nozzle to drink from. Just grab a hose, suck on the hose, love the hose. <laughs> um, hose is life. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was just asking because I've I've had a lot of waterlogged trail mix in my day. <laughs> I mean, it yeah. still gets eaten, but not the same. I guess I never, <laughs> I never end up with loose uh, snacks like that. I don't know. I always have like just like the the bars or something like a granola bar. Or, oh okay okay and though but like that's the critical thing certainly with canoes regardless is you definitely need waterproof gear for your stuff like yeah. at least one very solidly waterproof bag for all of your important gear oh yeah and now now that i am older and have a little more money than i did when i was like 17 or 18 and i do have waterproof bags but that back then it's like garbage bag ziploc bag boom waterproof let's go <laughs> <laughs> so on while we're on the topic of gear uh what do you guys do for cooking frozen food all the way for every single meal <laughs> so you're only you're only paddling in like january february no um definitely like dehydrated foods um but uh, depending how long i'm going i have uh, two different food barrels now. Um, one, if I'm doing like shorter trips for backpacking in general, then it's a 10 liter uh, bear proof barrel. Um, otherwise, for like multi day paddle trips, I have that, I forget, like 100 liter maybe. I think yeah, it was the big blue one. Yeah, that blue one, yeah. the, the old blue one. I learned my lesson from one of our first trips that Damien and I did it was carrying in canned. Oh, uh, yeah, so I've done that. That's so bad. I used to do TVP, but now I've kind of uh, gone and opted for uh, just, I, I go to the butcher and say like, hey, can I get like 500 grams of just a block of um, salami? And, and I'll just like slowly carve through the salami over the course of the trip. And because it's like naturally cured and everything, it doesn't go bad uh, outside of a fridge and it could take a beating. You don't have to baby it all through the trip. First nights, frozen steaks that slowly thaw over the course of the day that you're paddling. Um, and then water while you're paddling. Well, I'm excited because in the, around the ocean, you got to have a desalinator. How do you oh, get water? Oh, yeah, yeah. Good question. I haven't considered that. I'll tell you one thing I don't own out here is a water purifier. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> literally nothing i can use it on basically right so so yeah i have to carry my water with me i think the standard rule is something like 
uh, three liters per person per day or something that like that. That's so and low. Oh, it's four. Is it four? Yeah. Well, I go three. So I'm I'm dehydrated by the end of it. It's not an issue um, we have here. <laughs> yeah. Ontario, you're just sitting on your water basically as you're paddling. I, yeah, no, I. I mean, I we wish. still filter it, obviously, or treat it, but. Yeah, yeah it's still drinkable. <laughs> but you you definitely brought up the key thing, I think, Ian, to me, which is how long are you going for? Because I I made the foolish mistake of like doing like weekend trips where I'd be like, yeah, yeah, dehydrated food. Hell yeah, let's do it. It's this much for like all my meals. And, you know, like that gets tiring after a while. Um, Like they're not very, they, they certainly are decent for what they can do but they're not super tasty um so so if it's a weekend trip i'm definitely bringing eggs i'm definitely bringing bacon i'm definitely bringing like all the terrible meats that hopefully will survive long enough for me to eat them but like for like a week-long trip yeah then you kind of have to it's a little more plan planning, it right? a little <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah what are you guys cooking on when you camp are you just on a fire or you got like a stove I, I use a tiny little butane stove, just like a, a more basic one. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm over gas. Like, <laughs> that so was a bad in which case, I will take <laughs> your gas stove from you because um, I'm being more so toward the white gas now as opposed to the butane yeah. or the propane. That's so funny. Um, yeah. Like, it's, it's, it is easy. It is a lot less messy. Uh, the one thing I found about butane, though, like, um, if you're, like, toward the end of the life of one of the canisters, you're going to have to bring another one. And that just seems like a waste of space. The one thing I that really sold me on the white gas is camping in winter. Like that, the butane, yeah, it'll work in winter up to like minus five, I think is what it's advertised. Just to follow up on that, like certainly something that I've experienced here is elevation, right? Like yep. uh, elevation definitely impacts those canisters um, without question. So you're going to get way more longevity in general from a, a white gas, right? Because it's literally a liquid and it's a liquid the whole time. Um, so that's pretty good for that, for sure. Um, specifically, though, like I just find it just so much easier. And for something like like a, a kayak trip or a canoe trip where, where it is so uh, transportive, you know, like where I'm constantly just like the, the purpose of the trip is to travel the whole time and set up camp as quickly as possible and eat because I'm starving and I haven't eaten in six hours and God damn it, Ian, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> um, in that situation, I really do appreciate just like, yeah, I've, I've only ever used like white gas and propane. I, I try to use the white gas cause I don't like carrying all those green Coleman propane cylinders, but and to be clear, <laughs> those suck. Yeah. Don't ever carry those. Yeah. <laughs> but, but uh yeah. not a biking trip. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely, man. See, That's we're great. we're a family of four and quite often we'll have like my in laws with me, so six people. So we're not cooking meals for six people on the little one burner white gas stove. No way. Uh, well at that point. Are you getting, are you going with like the actual the stove? We have a like, proper two oh. burner, well proper, we have yeah. a two burner Coleman stove that runs off those green Coleman propane tanks, which I don't like because this is propane tanks. Uh, my parents recently gave me the older Coleman stove that runs off the white gas. Yes. So my goal for this year is to get that running because that's so much better. Yeah, you just my, carry so, that square can of white gas, and that's my it. Friend, That'll last you for like weeks. Yeah, my friend has one of those, and yeah, he loves it. Like it's big and bulky. Admittedly, I think for your use case, it's very important if you're feeding six. Well, I mean, bring. yeah, bulk is kind of like, going to be a factor when there's six people. <laughs> and and per head, it's probably way less bulky, right? Like, uh, eh, questionable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that would 
match up but like yeah um yeah yeah it's tricky yeah we we will go between like fire and that stove and then i have i also do have my little one burner white gas stove that that's like what we make our our hot drinks on i would say that's definitely a thing of any question at least bring some kind of stove because you're if you're relying on wood yeah don't bring lots of trail mix because you're gonna fail don't rely <laughs> yeah don't ever plan don't to rely just rely on, on wood yeah don't like you gotta have a backup Gotcha. Just in case gotcha. you don't know fair safety 101, don't put food in your tent. <laughs> food in your tent, period. Like, don't cook it, yeah, don't have just it. Don't there. have not, it. Just, it should not be anywhere near your, your tent, for sure. Fun fact, the uh, the food barrels that we were talking about earlier, uh, the small 10 liter one, you do not need to put in a tree because it has been certified like super bear proof in several states and um, you can only use that particular one i forget the name of it now funny enough but it's like the black plastic one and you've got two um, locks at the top that you need like either a coin or like a pocket knife to kind of open and uh, they've they've done a lot of r d into it the blue bear vaults yeah bears are smart enough now they they've gotten into those it's just a matter of puzzle so they figured that out. Bears are smart. Be careful. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Raccoons are also smart if you live in Ontario. Especially in Toronto. Especially in Toronto. <laughs> Raccoons are super stupid here in Vancouver. We still have them. I don't know why. They just we can have like all of our garbage without locks on it in Vancouver and, and they just can't figure that out. I don't know. They're real stupid here. Give them time. Give them another hundred years, they'll be on it. One other thing, uh, how, how do you guys, yeah, uh, protect your food uh, other than, like, I mean, you, you got the hang, you got the food barrels, any other ways that you guys have figured out works or doesn't work? Clean up, matter? clean up immediately. Like, you cook, you eat, you clean. Yeah, and I that goes for are... any camping. Front country, back country, like, keep yeah. your site clean. So, I would say yeah. I always, uh, I always just burn my leftovers if i'm not gonna eat them like i if i have a fire going i just throw them all in the fire yeah whatever it is whatever food it is yeah it does even packaging if the packaging is burnable yeah exactly like if it's oh, a food packaging for sure, like yeah. food packaging oh, yeah. yeah or compost like we'll we'll throw our tea bags our vegetable scraps and stuff get a good fire going we don't we don't yeah. burn like plastic or styrofoam or anything like that but any cardboard or scrap like only the good stuff, kids. Only the good Producer, stuff. Producer, user, cycle. I yeah. I will say about hanging food though, um, there it's a contentious issue. So I've been reading and uh, hearing as well, um, but in my experience, hanging food has definitely deterred black bears away. I know it's a lot more troublesome. Oh God, it could be so difficult too, like trying to get. Uh, your rope over the branches, just throwing it, having like your setup with pulleys and things like that, perhaps. But uh, it, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's kind of like a puzzle. Yeah. I don't mind it. I was, say, I was gonna <laughs> say, like, it's kind of fun though, you know? Like, like uh, what else are you gonna do? Especially when you have like such an efficient uh, gas stove, like I do. You know, you got all that free time to <laughs> you got all that free time to hang your food afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, hanging is just the key. Like uh, for me, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have like a cool food barrel, bear-proof thing. I just literally uh, hang my food as as high as I can and as far as I can from me without being a, a huge issue. Yeah, I, uh, even in bare barrels, we still hang. Just hang yeah. it. Yeah, just always hang. It's not yeah, gonna like, hurt. The the more complicated you can make to get to it, the better. Yeah. Like. Sometimes I, I've found trees where they're hanging o overhanging water and you're like, hell yeah, that's where I'm putting it. It's going to be a pain in the butt to get to it, but there's nothing that's going to be able to get that. So it's one of those like obstacle courses that we do to ourselves. Like, okay, you're on this platform. You got to jump to that thing over there. That's what the bear has to do. <laughs> but without all the safety behind them. Bear core. It's a parkour, bear core. Uh, 
The hardcore bear core? Hardcore bear core? Hardcore bear core. I love it. All right, on uh, hardcore bear core, I think that's probably a good time to call it. Uh, this is obviously a massive topic. We could talk about this for days and still only probably scratch the surface. So I think it's a good place to end. Uh, anything else you guys want to add? Yeah, I think uh, we covered a lot of topics, so it'd be great to hear your comments below. Put it in. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on what you'd like to hear more of, what to, to dive into more, explore, dissect, and um, yeah. Thank you for the first episode of Amateur Hour, and we will be back for the next one. See you later. See ya. Alright, on Hardcore Bearcore, I think it's a good spot to stop for the evening. This is obviously a massive topic that we could still talk about. We are still talking about it. This is the problem with multiple takes.